Welcome. Uh, on behalf of the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, uh, I'm Nines Ponce. I'm on the executive committee of the center. And I'm very happy to, I'm sure many of you are, since there's already been questions to the speaker before he's come up to the podium, to introduce um, the leader of the center, the center director, Professor Jerry Kaminsky. Um, Professor Jerry Kaminsky is uh, also in our department. He is our uh, expert in um, health insurance and cost effectiveness analysis at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Um, his topic today is implementing Obamacare. Is California still leading the nation? That's certainly a question, but what's not a question is Dr. Kaminsky is really the go-to, the expert. Uh, you've heard him on NPR, you've heard him on several radio stations. He goes to many talks to community organizations, League of Women Voters, everywhere. I think he's being cloned. I think people have seen him <laughs> several places at the same time. But he is for sure here live today at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. And we welcome all of those joining us in the webinar today. Grand rules, we're trying to keep this in one hour. So let's give a applause to Dr. Kaminsky. Nines, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here to talk today about um, the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare. Um, the uh, Nines is absolutely right. I've been speaking. It seems like I've been speaking everywhere, and um, I've also apparently there are clips of me on the television that are being recycled. So uh, when someone says they saw me on the news this morning, uh, that's news to me because that I did but did not film a new clip uh, this morning. But um, it's my pleasure to be here to talk to you today. Uh, the title of my talk uh, implies that I have up-to-date information on how we're doing in California, and I do have some up-to-date information, but the, the you're going to have to wait until the very end um, to hear the latest figures. And I'm going to give you some data from California, and I'm going to give you some data that I was able to find yesterday with regard to the rest of the nation. Um, and so hopefully I'll be able to provide some context about where California is team stands in terms of implementing um, and enrolling people in affordable health insurance, which is the key provision of the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare. Just to remind everybody, I think everybody in this room and probably most people on the webinar know that um, Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act are one and the same thing. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel has a funny YouTube <laughs> video that illustrates that people don't necessarily, you know, the, the man and woman in the street don't necessarily know that they are one and the same thing. And of course, that makes for uh, interesting um, political confusion and the opportunity to uh, blur the distinction between what's in the law and what is Obamacare. They are one and the same thing. Um, but um, that is sort of the state of our uh, of politics um, right now. Uh, and um, I'm sure that uh, during the course of this talk, we may in fact hear something about a resolution on the debt ceiling and the government shutdown. And as everybody on this in the room knows, uh, Obamacare has been used and, and is uh, being held hostage by the Republicans. Uh, but nevertheless, it is moving forward with implementation. So let me move forward. What is happening with regard to the implementation? So one of the fundamental questions that people continue to be confused about is who is eligible for benefits? And the bottom line is that the Affordable Care Act primarily provides benefits to individuals and families up to 400% of the federal poverty level who do not currently have affordable qualifying health insurance. Now I'm gonna define what that affordable insurance is in a couple minutes, and I'm also gonna define what the federal poverty level and what 400% is in just a minute as well. Because as I've learned, uh, most of us know or have a pretty good idea of what our salaries or earnings are, but what that is or what that means relative to the federal poverty level, I don't think even people who work on this day in and day out know exactly where they are pegged to that uh, federal poverty level scale. But the Affordable Care Act is provides coverage for two targeted audiences based on income. 
For people between 139 and 400% of the poverty level, there are federal subsidies that are now available to purchase insurance in new regulated state-based or uh, federal uh, exchanges. Um, and in California, our exchange is known as Covered California, and I'll be talking more about it in a minute. For people who are below 139% of the federal poverty level, they are now eligible, depending on the state in which they live, to enroll in, it, in expanded Medicaid. Uh, and of course, in California, the Medicaid program is known as Medi-Cal. Uh, children up to age uh, uh, 18 or below age 19 um, in California are still eligible up to 250% to enroll in the Medicaid program, and that will be true uh, moving forward as well. Uh, I will comment that um, the latest figures are that there are 26 states that are not expanding their Medicaid programs, although I understand that Ohio is on the verge of tipping. Um, and that the latest estimates are that 5.2 million low-income individuals in those states will not be eligible for Medicaid benefits uh, because their states have chosen not to take advantage of the Medicaid expansion. And just to remind everybody, the Medicaid expansion was the one aspect of the Affordable Care Act that the um, Supreme Court did find on unconstitutional last year was the mandatory expansion and the, benef and the uh, penalty that went along with um, not um, expanding the program. The Supreme Court deemed that penalty um, uh, to be excessively punitive and said that states therefore had the option, that was the compromise, or I should say that the legal solution was that states had the option to expand their Medicaid program. So what is your uh, FPL? Um, it depends on your income and your family size. And so there are many different possibilities uh, based on every additional person in your family. So I've just picked two uh, sort of common uh, family compositions to give. Um, the cut point for expanded eligibility for kids and for other benefits up to 250% of poverty is about 28,700. And then subsidies are potentially available all the way up to um, 46, roughly $46,000 for a single individual. For a family of four, uh, 23,005 is the federal poverty level. The first cut point uh, for distinguishing eligibility for Medi-Cal versus uh, subsidy is around 30 to 7. Uh, up to 250% gets you to almost 59,000. And then subsidies are potentially available all the way up to, to 94,200. And I say potentially available because what we're seeing, particularly in the California market, is that some families um, close to 400% are not necessarily getting subsidies because the insurance in California, the premiums came in so low that um, uh, subsidies aren't available for some families up to 400%. But I'll come back to that when I show you what the premiums are uh, in Los Angeles in a few minutes. So how many Californians are eligible for ACA benefits? Well, this is work that we've been doing, uh, my colleagues uh, in the center, uh, Dylan Rovey, um, uh, Greg Watson, uh, 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 Zhao Cho, um, um, and who else has been involved at UC Berkeley, uh, Ken Jacobs. Um, we've been working with Covered California to estimate eligibility and likely enrollment um, in, the, uh, in the exchange, uh, as well as eligibility for the expanded Medicaid program, Medi-Cal. Uh, so our estimates are that about 6.5 Californians are eligible under age 65. And uh, we focus on the non-elderly population because the vast majority of the elderly qualify for, for Medicare. 
Uh, of that 6.5 million, about 2.6 million um, are eligible for um, exchange subsidies. And of that 2.6 million, about 1.6 million are currently uninsured. Uh, 570,000 buy insurance now on their own without subsidies in the uh, individual market. 430,000 have insurance at work, but that insurance is unaffordable. And about 50,000, we estimate, will lose insurance uh, uh, at their place of employment as a result of the ACA requirements. Uh, the 450, uh, 430,000 who have unaffordable insurance, the affordab affordability standard under the law is that if you are required to pay more than 9.5% of your income or salary for health insurance, and specifically for a single policy, then you are deemed to have unaffordable insurance through your place of employment. And then therefore you are allowed to go into the exchange and seek a subsidy. Otherwise you have to take up your employer's offer um, or buy insurance on your own. Uh, with regard to Medi-Cal eligibility, we estimate that about 1.4 million are newly eligible for Medi-Cal. Uh, and that includes 850,000 who are currently uninsured, 240,000 who buy insurance on their own today without subsidies, and another 320,000 who have insurance through their place of employment. And then finally, we estimate that there are almost 2.5 million Californians who are currently eligible for Medi-Cal but not enrolled. And that includes, again, another 850,000. That's just a coincidence. It's not a typo. Um, 850,000 uninsured, 280,000 who buy insurance on their own, and 1.3 million who have insurance through their place of employment, and is maybe one of the primary reasons why they are not signing up for Medicaid, despite the fact that they're eligible. So you can see that there are large, uh, uh, a large percentage of California's population potentially eligible for benefits under the under the ACA. So how do, how do you know if you qualify for these benefits? Well, Covered California is the place to go to find out. It's the new private insurance market that opened for business on October 1st. So it's been open now for two weeks. Um, and Covered California is the place that um, can make eligibility determinations. By law, they are required to make determinations via the telephone, via the internet, via mail applications, or in person. Um, they have been training certified enrollment counselors um, through what are known as certified enrollment entities to work with community organi organizations to get people enrolled. And I'll come back and talk about this in terms of the figures, um, the number of people who've been trained. Uh, ultimately, the goal is 20,000. The, to date, the number of people who've been certified is substantially lower than that number. So there's still a lot of ongoing training uh, going on to get people out in the community as certified enrollment counselors. Um, Covered California can determine if you're eligible for a subsidy, but they have a, what's known as a wrong, no wrong door policy. So if you qualify for Medi-Cal, um, they will make sure it is their responsibility to hand you off to a Medi-Cal enrollment specialist. So uh, they will not just tell you to call another number and good luck with your Medi-Cal application. The application for Medi-Cal as well as for the subsidy are essentially the same application. And they will make sure that you get a soft handoff to a, an enrollment counselor uh, so that you don't fall through the cracks. Uh, this is the website. Um, I'll show you stats uh, at the end uh, about the number of visits to date. Um, the website's changed appearance a couple times over the last two weeks. But this is the way it looked yesterday. Uh, I don't think that it's changing dramatically, but they have changed the, the home page a couple times. I've put the, um, the web address right in the middle there in the blue box. So it is coveredca.com. And the reason I emphasize that is coveredcalifornia.com will take you to a different website. And coveredcalifornia.gov will take you to a different website. I'm not sure that's an active website. But 
Uh, there is a little bit of confusion about what the web address is for Covered California. So it is Covered CA. And as you know, web addresses really are not case sensitive. So it doesn't matter whether you have capital CA or not at the end. But um, uh, this is where you go to, uh, so, first of all, to shop for insurance. And one of the advantages of uh, California's website is down here, I don't know if my, if you can see my cursor circling down here, but right here at the bottom in the middle is a little calculator. And California's website has a shop and compare fe feature, which is not available on the healthcare.gov website, which is the federal website for states that don't have their, their own exchange. Uh, this is a really useful feature. And if you haven't been on it, go and, and use this feature because you can type in either your personal circumstances. You don't have to, you can make up or you can make up a family composition. Um, but you can put in data on age, uh, number of people in your family, the age of people in your family, where you live, and it will show you all the available plans and whether or not based on the income that you put in, whether you're eligible for a subsidy or not. So this was the purpose, uh, and this is a fundamental feature of reform, to make comparison shopping as easy as possible. And I would say that California has done an excellent job of making this comparative information uh, readily available. Of course, if you actually want to apply for insurance rather than shop, uh, like I, I've been doing and like uh, apparently hundreds of thousands of other Californians have been doing, you can go to that yellow button right in the middle that um, I, it, you know, how many PhDs does it take to figure out a website? Uh, I didn't see that button. <laughs> uh, uh, three, the first three times I visited the website and had to ask a colleague, so how do I actually sign up for insurance? He said, well, see the yellow button. Oh, you mean the one that's right in the middle of the page, <laughs> that button? Yeah, that's the button that you go to to actually sign up for benefits. And I just didn't see it straight in front of my nose. So, so what kind of insurance is being sold on uh, by Covered California? Well, uh, all of the policies in the exchange have to have the following features. They have to cover essential health benefits. And I'll tell you what those are in just a second. Um, they have to have limits on out-of-pocket spending. They have to provide no cost coverage for uh, preventive services. Um, they cannot have annual or lifetime limits on the benefits uh, in terms of dollar caps. So those are no, no longer allowed. Their premiums are based only on age, the geographic area where you live, and in California there are 19 market areas, and your family size. Um, the important thing about all of these policies and one of the fundamental aspects of reform is that insurers cannot charge you more for pre-existing conditions. So pre-existing conditions are no longer a basis for um, insuring uh, California's population for these policies. In addition, uh, the policies have to be one of four approved metal tiers of coverage, and I'll show you what those are in just a second. I keep hitting the wrong button to advance the slides. Um, what are the essential health benefits? Well, these are the 10 categories. Now, these are the 10 categories that are actually in the federal law um, and are explicitly identified that all policies in all exchanges have to have essential benefits. Because the law allows for state variation in implementation, this is one aspect of the law that where there is state variation. So all states must sell plans in their exchanges with, that cover benefits in these 10 categories. But the level of benefits or the specific benefits within each of these categories are subject to some variation. So for example, there was an article in yesterday's paper, I'm not sure if it was the Washington Post, talking about the fact that in Virginia's exchange, I believe that gastric um, uh, banding surgery is not part of the essential health benefit package. Uh, it can be purchased as a separate rider, but if you want that coverage, it costs $1,800 a year. Um, whereas in Maryland, it's included in the essential health benefits. And that's just because the law allows for state-to-state -state variation um, 
uh, in some of these benefits. But the other comment that I want to make about these 10 categories is that although I think most of us would agree that uh, certainly when you look at the first three categories that all insurance should and generally does cover these, um, it's when we get sort of to the middle of the pack and certainly towards the end of the list that insurers may or may not have provided these benefits in the past. So maternity benefits is, is a good example. Here in California, until just recently, within the last few years, maternity benefits were not required to be provided by insurance companies. And in fact, insurers were moving in the direction of excluding maternity benefits as a mechanism for um, keeping the cost of, of health insurance, quote unquote, more affordable. Prescription drugs uh, have not always been included. Uh, um, and you can buy, I was shopping online last night, you can buy policies today that exclude prescription drugs as a way of keeping the cost of the policy uh, lower. Uh, certainly when we look at some of the things like rehabilitation services, mental health and substance abuse coverage, and pediatric services, including dental and vision, those are not necessarily always provided by insurers. So, you know, I would characterize the essential health benefits as a relatively uh, comprehensive set of benefits compared to policies that are typically available in the individual market. Now, relative to what's available to large employers and offered to employees by large employers, this is a much more uh, common set of benefits. I mentioned that the, the plans have to be one of four metal tiers, and this is in, a, in the sort of the most uh, general and basic description, what those four tiers are in California. Now, again, the federal law says that, there, that exchanges have to offer bronze, silver, gold, and platinum plans, and those levels are based on what's known as the actuarial value of the plan. Now, actuarial value is just a sort of a, a fancy way of saying that what portion of the, um, uh, the benefits are covered by the premium versus what portion of the overall benefits are paid for out of pocket. So the bronze plans are supposed to have an actuarial value of 60%, meaning that on average, the premium will cover 60% of the covered benefits under that plan and 40% of the cover, of the cost of the covered benefits will come from out-of-pocket payments. And I hope that even if you're not familiar with the term actuarial value, that that common sense description means that this is going to be a low premium, high out-of-pocket spending. And if you look at the benefits here, that's exactly what you see. It's a $5,000 deductible plan, meaning you have to spend $5,000 first before any insurance benefit kicks in. So you have a lot of out-of-pocket liability under this bronze plan. It is a high deductible plan. Once you meet that deductible for medical and drugs, then you get some coverage. You get, but you pay $60 uh, per primary care visit. You pay $19 per prescription drug. I'm sorry, generic medication prescription. Uh, you'd pay $300 co-payment uh, for an ER visit. But that's up to a maximum of $63.50 per person for $12,007 for a family. So once you reach those, those limits on spending, then insurance will pay the rest of the bill. So this is kind of an unusual plan. Very high deductible, a lot of out-of-pocket spending. Then you get some coverage for a couple thousand dollars of worth of spending. And then once you reach your, your cap for annual spending, then insurance will pay the rest. So this is really sort of a catastrophic plan. It's not called catastrophic, but it's as close to a catastrophic policy as you can describe or think of. On the other extreme is the platinum plan. This has an actuarial value of 90%, uh, which means that the premium should pay 90% of the total cost of the covered benefits uh, and out-of-pocket spending should be lower. So you see no deductible, $20 co-payments for primary care visits, $5 co-payments for generic drugs, $150 co-payments, and the maximum out-of-pocket spending is lower relative to the other three tiers. So you only have to spend up to $4,000 out-of-pocket as an individual or $8,000 as a family. And then after that, your insurance covers the total cost. So these four levels um, are the 
tiers that insurers have to offer in covered California. And I will say that California in many ways has gone beyond the requirements uh, in the federal law. And this is an example where California went one step further. California standardized the policies in these metal tiers such that every insurer has to have the same benefit structure that's outlined here. Now, there's a more specific benefit structure in terms of the co-payments, but every bronze plan has the same deductible and co-payment schedule in California. Every silver plan does. And they conform with what's shown here in this general slide. The reason California did that is to make it easier to do true comparison shopping between plans. So when you buy a next year on the exchange, or if you go shopping now for a bronze plan, every company that sells a bronze plan in any market of this in the state is selling the same essential benefit package and the same co-payment structure. There is no difference between companies in those bronze plans with one important difference. The network of providers that's part of that company's product. So when you buy a Kaiser bronze plan, of course, everybody in California knows and anybody who has Kaiser anywhere else knows that you're buying Kaiser doctors and hospitals. That's, we just know that. But when you buy HealthNet's bronze plan, you're buying a limited network of doctors and hospitals that HealthNet has contracted with. And you may or may not know, my guess is most of us don't know what doctors and hospitals are in that network because the network was created specifically for the exchange. So as UCLA, for example, employees, we have HealthNet as an option. The doctors and hospitals in our health net option may not be the same as the doctors and hospitals in the exchange network. Separate negotiations, separate products, even though it's health net. So it's not like Kaiser in that, in that respect. And as a result, it means that people shopping in the exchange will have a much greater sort of responsibility for looking at the provider network above and beyond looking at the benefits and the levels of these metal tiers. So uh, this may not be of immediate relevance to the people in this room or the people watching, but uh, certainly one of the most common questions, how much is this going to cost me? How much do these plans cost? If you qualify for Medi-Cal, these plans are not going to cost you anything with the exception of children above 139 up to 250% of federal poverty. Those children were formerly in healthy families and there is a small monthly co-payment associated with that, and that will continue for children above 139. But basically, Medi-Cal eligibility means you pay nothing on a monthly basis. If you qualify for an exchange subsidy, the amount that you're going to pay depends on your federal poverty level, the age of your family members, and which plan you buy. So without getting into all the possible combinations, the first determination is how much do I have to pay on a monthly basis? That's a that's tied to my income and my federal poverty level. It starts at 3% of income um, at 139%, and it goes up to 9.5% of income on a sliding scale at 400% of the federal poverty level. So the point is the more, the higher my income, the more I have to contribute to health insurance. The subsidy then is the difference between what I'm required to pay and the cost of the second lowest silver plan in my market. And I alluded to the fact earlier that some people at the high end of the scale in California, because they're required to pay 9.5% of their income and the premiums in California are relatively low, the premium, they're their required contribution means that they're not eligible for a subsidy. Although in theory, anybody up to 400% can get a subsidy. The point is the cost of the insurance is less than 9.5% of their income. So they're not getting a subsidy. And frankly, 
I think that was good news, but it was a shock to me when the when the premiums first came out and we looked at the examples under Covered California and saw that some people at the very high end were not getting subsidies in it. We said, wait a minute, everybody's eligible. Why is there no subsidy here? Because the premiums came in much lower than many people expected. And I think overall that's good news for Californians. But it, what it does mean is that there are some people who are going to go to the exchange and say, look, my, you told me my income is 350% of the federal poverty level. Where's my subsidy? And there are going to be family members who don't, who don't get them. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is that uh, for individuals between 139% up to 250%, there are additional subsidies available for those families to have um, lower deductibles and co-payments, but only if they select the silver plan. So this is really a very powerful incentive for people at the lower end of el eligibility in the exchange to select a silver plan because their, their co-payments and deductible and out of, uh, annual spending limits are subsidized and as a result, much lower than the typical silver plan. Uh, what do these premiums look like? Well, here's just an example, one example um, for Los Angeles County. I mentioned that uh, California uh, has 19 market areas. South Los Angeles County is region 16. And South Los Angeles County, basically, uh, Los Angeles has been divided along, I guess it's the San Gabriel Mountains. So, Basically, the high desert Palmdale area is North Los Angeles County, and everything below that is South Los Angeles. Um, you can see that there are six different uh, companies selling eight different products uh, in the marketplace for next year, and there's quite a bit of variation in the cost. So the 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 uh, cheapest bronze plan is $196 a month for a 40-year-old. This is before any subsidies. Uh, and it goes that bronze plan goes up to $301 a month, um, so almost $105 more expensive. Uh, the cheapest silver plan is HealthNet, $242, and it goes up to $325 for Kaiser. Um, and if you look at HealthNet, which tends to be the lowest cost, um, or is the lowest cost plan in the silver, gold, and platinum tiers, HealthNet's platinum plan is less expensive than Kaiser's silver plan in Los Angeles. So you can get sig significantly more protection mm -hmm. for a lower monthly cost um, if you're willing to go into HealthNet's uh, HMO rather than Kaiser. So I know that many of us were surprised that Kaiser was uh, the most expensive in many marketplaces, and I'm happy to come back and uh, address that uh, during Q&A, what some of the reasons might be for that. What happens if I'm already insured? Uh, well, if you like your insurance and you can afford it on your own, you, you don't need to do anything, um, but um, it, it depends on whether you're getting your insurance or your place of employment or, or whether you're buying it on your own. So if you're getting it through your employer, uh, and this gets back to the affordability issue that I said before, and your policy is considered unaffordable because it costs you more than 9.5% of income, you probably qualify for a subsidy with the caveat that it's 9.5% to buy the individual coverage. So if you buy family coverage through your place of employment, it doesn't matter how much you spend. You'll, you'll never, you, you don't trigger the affordability um, or the unaffordability uh, criterion. It's only if you're spending more than 9.5% or would have to spend more than 9.5% to buy single coverage. And there are, uh, there's a loophole even in this that I can come back and talk about during Q&A uh, that large employers can get around this requirement by offering uh, some very narrow benefit plans that unfortunately were not outlawed by the law and apparently are going to be a solution to make sure that no one has unaffordable insurance at work. Um, if you buy insurance on your own today without a subsidy, 
it's very likely that you qualify for a subsidy. Our estimates are that at least a third of the market today uh, of among the more than 2 million people who buy insurance without a subsidy, at least a third uh, and perhaps more will qualify for subsidies next year. So um, even if you're buying it on your own today, it, you have a high likelihood that you could get subsidized insurance next year. Another question that comes up is, what if I'm on Medicare? Uh, how does all of this affect me? If you are on Medicare, this the, the ACA largely is, is not targeted to you. Do not go to the exchange. Do not, do not go shopping. Do not go shopping for insurance there. Um, however, there are a couple, there are some aspects of the ACA that affect you. So there's good news and bad news. I'll give you the good news first. The good news is if you are on Medicare and you buy Medi Medicare Part D coverage, the prescription drug benefit, you will have lower expenses if you fall into the so-called donut hole. And the donut hole is that, that crazy aspect of prescription drug coverage where you have coverage for about $3,000. You have a deductible, then you have coverage up until about $3,000 of spending and then your, your benefits go away for about $3,000 and you're paying 100% of the cost. Well, ACA is filling that donut hole, and it, but it's slow. It's like filling a, if you ever had a pool and tried to fill a pool with a hose, <laughs> it's gonna take 10 years to fill up the donut hole. Very slow process, um, but it will be uh, uh, filled up um, uh, over a period of 10 years. The bad news for Medicare beneficiaries, and this is particularly relevant in California, is if you are in a Medicare Part C plan, which is known as Medicare Advantage, and this means basically you're in an HMO, managed care, um, Congress is ending the subsidies that they've provided for over a decade to Part C plans. The reason they're ending the subsidies is that 10 years ago, Congress basically <laughs> struck a deal with uh, HMOs and they were fleeing the Medicare market because of a dispute over payment. Congress said, wait a minute, we want you back. So they bought them flowers basically. And the flowers were in the form of subsidies that said, well, just basically, we're going to pay you a lot more than we would have to pay for beneficiaries in traditional Medicare because we really, we want you back in the market. And, um, uh, Providers responded very strongly. If you look at the enrollment, enrollment shot back up. And the reason is because it's a win-win situation for both the providers and for beneficiaries. Beneficiaries were getting free services that are not generally covered by Medicare because they're not part of Medicare approved or covered services. So for things like eyeglasses, for example. So HMOs were providing these services for free with subsidies from Congress and beneficiaries were getting additional benefits. So it was a good deal and enrollment continues to go up in the Part C plans. Well, the subsidies are ending and as a result, Medicare beneficiaries in managed care plans. And in California, there are 40% of seniors are in managed care or in Part C. They're gonna feel like they're, something's being taken away and Something is being taken away, but what's being taken away are not Medicare benefits. This is not a cut in Medicare. This is a cut in the subsidies to buy extra things that other people in traditional Medicare have to pay out of their own pocket. So this is more of a level of leveling the playing field rather than taking something away. But anybody who's in one of these plans is nevertheless going to feel like they're being something's being taken away from them. So doesn't my employer have a responsibility to offer affordable coverage? I mean, we've heard a lot about individual mandates. I haven't talked about that yet. I'm going to finish with a slide on that. But what's the responsibility of my employer? Well, this has been postponed for a year. The president announced this um, about a month ago that employers have now another year to comply with, with um, what's known as the employer mandate, but it's, it's really not a mandate. Um, the requirement, however, is starting in January of 2015, is that firms, first of all, firms with less than 50 full-time equivalent employees do not have to offer health insurance. So 
small firms do not have to offer health insurance. The requirement applies to firms with 50 or more full-time equivalent employees. But even in those firms, employers do not have to offer health insurance benefits to their part-time workers. And what you're hearing in the news recently is the two best or most recent examples, Whole Foods and Home Depot are not going to continue offering health insurance to their part-time workers. Now, in the case of Whole Foods, they explained, I think, pretty clearly why they weren't doing it. They said, if we offer the insurance and the worker turns it down because it's not affordable to them, not and not because of the affordability standard that I talked about, but they just feel it's too expensive, then they cannot go to the, subs to the exchange and get a subsidy. However, if we don't offer it to part-time workers, they can go and qualify for a subsidy. And most part-time workers, if, they, if that's their primary source of income and they're working part-time, will qualify for a subsidy. In addition, Whole Foods said, we're gonna, we're gonna subsidize all our part-time workers with a $500 contribution to buy health insurance. So based on their analysis, they said most of their workers are gonna be much better off. And they would be penalizing their workers if they offered insurance and the workers didn't take it up because they would not be able to get a subsidy. That doesn't mean that all employers are gonna be that uh, uh, altruistic. And I can tell you from community meetings that I've participated in in the last two weeks that I'm now meeting people who are saying my hours have been cut because my company doesn't want to offer health insurance and uh, I don't want health insurance, but now I, I'm a part time worker and I don't want to be a part time worker and I don't want health insurance either. So this is unfortunately one of the one of the um, uh, negative consequences that we're going to see among some employers. What happens if I still can't afford insurance? You know, we've got subsidies available. We've got an expanded Medi-Cal program that we believe is going to enroll more than 1.5 million people in the course of the next couple of years. Um, but there's still people who are gonna fall through the cracks. Um, the largest group in California are the undocumented. The undocumented don't qualify for subsidies and don't qualify for Medi-Cal. Um, and, furthermore, cannot buy insurance in the exchange because when you go to buy insurance in the exchange, you have to provi provide a social security number. So the option available to the uninsured, undocumented will be if you want to buy insurance in the individual market, there will still be a market outside the exchange. So that's one option. The other is to depend on the uh, charitable care and, and uh, free clinics and, and federally qualified health centers, for example. Um, but there'll be other people who even qualify for subsidies uh, who won't take up the insurance because based on their decision and their family budget, they'll feel that even with the subsidy, the insurance is not affordable. Um, so counties are gonna continue to provide indigent care services in Los Angeles that's uh, healthy Way LA, uh, and then federally qualified health centers, free clinics, county hospitals will still provide care uh, regardless of ability to pay. So there still will be a safety net out there. All right, finally, what if I, do, I just don't want to buy insurance? So this gentleman that stood up in, in Inglewood on Saturday and, and, and was very angry and told me, I do not want to buy insurance and I, I have my hours cut. I don't want insurance, and you're telling me I'm going to have to pay a penalty. So you're taking money out of my pocket twice. Fewer hours, and I have to pay a tax penalty. And what am I getting in exchange? Um, the fact is that this law will does have an individual mandate or a, an individual responsibility requirement. If you do not get insurance, um, Many people will have to pay a penalty. Uh, not everybody who's uninsured will have to pay the penalty next year. There are exemptions. Um, in particular, people who are, whose income are, is low enough that they don't have to file income taxes will not be subject to the penalty. And the estimate is that next year that threshold will be about $10,000 for filing. So anybody with income less than that will not be subject to it. 
uh, members of recognized uh, Native American tribes do not have to pay the penalty. Uh, people who file for religious uh, objections will be granted ex exceptions. So there are exceptions. But the penalty starts out at $95 a person next year, increasing to $695 a person in 2016. Uh, for families, the tax is uh, uh, $285 or 1% of income next year, or 2085 or 2.5% of income in 2016. So the idea is that if you're being penalized and getting nothing in exchange in terms of the incentive, the difference between paying the penalty and, and getting subsidized insurance will push more people into the insurance market. And this is the reason why this can't be delayed for a year. Unfortunately, Secretary Sebelius could not answer that question when asked five different times by John Stewart on a recent television program. But I'm here to tell you that her answer should have been, if this is postponed, significantly fewer people will feel the pressure to sign up for insurance because they can continue to be free riders. And there are no consequences because they'll still be eligible to get free care. And that is the reason why this can't be postponed. We, we did an analysis here in California that suggested that uh, more than a million people would forego uh, insurance if the individual mandate were either postponed or eliminated. So I promised you some hard numbers. Let me finish uh, by showing you the numbers that, that I have uh, released by Covered California. Uh, and uh, late last night, or, or I should say late yesterday afternoon, some week two numbers. So I mentioned the exchange has been open for two weeks. They report almost a million unique visits to their website in week one, uh, another 600,000 in week two. Call volume in their call centers, uh, about 60,000 calls week one, about 46,000 last week. They're showing average handling time. That's a pretty sig significant improvement. Uh, week one, you had to wait on average 15 minutes, although there was a footnote that I removed from this slide. They showed that after four days, they were down to four minutes and 30 some seconds. So it was really the first three days that they were really having a hard time answering calls. Last week, average wait times were a minute 55. Uh, and then the application process looks like it's taking about 15 minutes. Now, they did not release any information about applications or partially completed, but in week one, 43,000 applications, 27,000 partially completed, 16,000 completed, covering almost 29,000 individuals. So I was asked by several news reporters uh, and uh, NPR last week, is this a, a reasonable rate? I said, first of all, the numbers are way too small to extrapolate. I mean, but if you're asking me, here's the simple math. Covered California's stated target, based on work that we've done for them, is roughly six hundred thousand dollars. This uh, six hundred thousand dollars, six hundred thousand people this year. Um, open enrollment is a six-month open enrollment, so this is their target for by April first. So we can all do this simple math: six hundred thousand divided by six is a hundred thousand a month. There are thirty days on average in a month. They need to enroll about thirty-three hundred people a day. The figures that are reported here are for the first five days that they were open. So if that simple math tells me that they're, they're ahead of schedule, but it doesn't really matter whether they were in the first. What matters is what's after a month and what matters is on January 1st, are they well on the way to meeting this target? Are they close to, if it's gonna be an even enrollment process, are they at 300,000? And I would hope that the, it's not even. I would hope that people are not waiting until February to sign up for benefits um, if they're eligible for them. I would like to see them meet this target as quickly as possible before the end of this calendar year. Um, so it's hard to extrapolate. And it's also, uh, I will say that I am reluctant to contribute uh, to the noise and the disinformation about this by commenting on overnight returns. And I actually did say that on television last week, that I think that uh, we need to take a deep breath. This is not 
the television industry or the movie industry. We're not interested in overnight sweeps. We don't need to know what what we did this weekend. You know, my daughter works in, in the movie industry. Those weekend sales figures are, you know, you live and die by them. We don't need to live and die by this. People will die if they're not signed up for insurance. But whether they sign up today or next week or December 7th doesn't matter because their benefits don't start until January 1st. So what I want to see is continued progress between now and middle of December. And also, since it's going to, I want to see people continue to enroll afterwards as well. So uh, I feel like we're being uh, supporters of the law are being put in a reactionary position by the opponents and saying, well, you know, it's not really working. And the overnight figures prove that it's not working. Well, you've created a, that's really we don't need to focus on overnight numbers. So let me finish by showing you the only data that I've been able to to find. Um, and I spent a fair amount of time yesterday looking around. There's a website by a company called the Advisory Board Company. Um, I'm always reluctant to pull data off of the web uh, without a clear idea of the source because you never know where it really has come from. Um, as far as I can tell, based on this company's website, um, they are uh, attempting to be uh, as neutral as possible in the information that they're providing about the ACA. So I don't have any reason to believe that these are politically charged or nuanced numbers, but this is the table that they've compiled. And the reason we don't have the data is it hasn't been released federally. And for the states that are running their own exchange, um, you know, they're either releasing it or they're not releasing it. But getting back to the sort of the title of my talk, um, is California still in the lead? Well, if California has actually enrolled 29,000 people as of the first five days, the answer is we are in the lead, but there are others that are gaining. So Washington State seems to be doing a good idea, or a good job based on this table. Uh, Kentucky, of all places, is doing well. Now, I listened, I listened to, to Senator Rand Paul say that he represented, his job was to, was to represent the people of his state who opposed Obamacare. Um, my guess is that the 33,000 people who signed up for accounts didn't vote or didn't get that memo. <laughs> um, and the almost 11,000 who signed up already also did not get that memo. So the point is that I think, you know, uh, there's been a lot of speculation that the reason why uh, the GOP wanted to shut the government down and stop Obamacare from being implemented was because of the, they, they also understand that once you have people getting health insurance, it's going to be very hard to take it away. Um, and that's exactly what we want to happen. So uh, it's happening. It's happening maybe more slowly. Um, if we didn't have all of this hoopla regarding the shutdown of the government, you might see a lot more positive messaging out there around Obamacare rather than it being, in a sense, viewed by a lot of people as the reason why the government is shut down. Um, but nevertheless, things are moving forward. And because I have taken a little bit longer in my presentation, I'm just going to stop there and open it up for questions so that we at least have a few minutes. So, yes. Yes. I don't think so. I, I don't think that anything's changed with regard to requirements about providers treating uninsured patients. Now, I think that although I don't have you know hard evidence, I think that the hospitals and healthcare providers are going to have just as they do now, um, you know, hospitals have an incentive to determine if you're eligible for Medi-Cal. So I think that hospitals and, and clinics 
will continue to have an incentive to try and see if people are walking into their you know, office or showing up in the emergency room and saying, I'm uninsured, to do a quick determination whether or not they qualify for Medi-Cal and expanded Medi-Cal, which will be even easier to determine, um, and or a subsidy, or I should say, or a subsidy. So I think there'll still be that incentive. And that's the way I think some people who don't go and sign up will get signed up. Now, with Medi-Cal, there'll be enrollment throughout the, the year. With the exchange, it's an open enrollment period. So if you don't sign up by March 1st, 2014, then you're gonna have to wait until October 1st of 2014 to sign up. Unless you have a qualifying event, and a qualifying event includes a change in your family, composition, significant change, um, or loss of job, for example. Um, so the fact that you've got only certain windows during the course of the year to sign up means that um, the burden is still going to be on individuals. But, you know, I think that hospitals, as I say, will have an incentive during open enrollment period to see if somebody who comes in and says that they're uninsured, whether they qualify for a subsidy to try and get them enrolled. Um, but that's not, well, anyway, it's not going to guarantee that that bill is going to be paid. Yes, Amy. Um, question about UCLA. I've been getting patients asking questions like this. So I talk to them. Did anybody from financial guilt? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, no, the reason I ask that is because I've been told that as of yet, the only people that we have or the only company we could have a deal with is of these options here are the Anthem and Blue Cross. So that when patients ask us, we can say, you know, things are being negotiated, but we don't really know. So my question then is, do can somebody figure out who is covered under a six eight six um, health net versus Blue Cross versus one of the other health care? Is there a way to know now by calling a place? I mean, apparently UCLA you can't tell people; you can only tell them a little bit. So is, is this all being worked out with all these different? So Amy, I'm, not, I'm let, let me make sure I understand your question. So your your patients want to know if they can go to the same doctor. So so how are they? I'll I'll repeat the question for the the audience, but I just want to make sure I understand it. So are they're currently insured? Some of the yes, the ones that are asking, but there's other ones I wonder about that are going to ask. Yeah. So anybody who's currently insured. Okay, so anybody who's currently insured but might change their insurance as a result of the subsidy. So, you know, they might be buying it themselves now, but they're going to switch a plan. They might be switching plans, or even they might not switch companies. Let's say they have HealthNet. Okay, so, right, they keep HealthNet, but the HealthNet exchange plan, which they can get uh, cheaper next year because they'll qualify for subsidy, may have a narrower network of providers. So this is why um, I would say right now, this is one of the most crucial pieces of information on Covered California's website that's not available right today. And Peter Lee commented on this, uh, I believe yesterday in the news, which is Covered California, knowing that the provider network is a crucial piece of information, that people need that information to make an informed choice. He, he said that as director of Covered California, he pushed to get that information on the website as quickly as possible. And they had to take it down because it wasn't working last week. It wasn't working satisfactorily. So I don't know what the uh, when it's going to be back up, but if you're shopping today for policies, you cannot look at least, um, I sh should say last night, I don't know if it went up this morning. I haven't been on the website this morning. Last night, you couldn't shop for a provider. And so, I, you know, if I were shopping for a plan on Covered California, I'd shop on price today, but I certainly wouldn't make a decision. I, yeah, I wouldn't uh, buy now. And of course, I couldn't find the button anyway, so it wouldn't matter. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, my information, which is not official, uh, although I will say it, um, 
is that UCLA is not in the network for any of the exchange plans. Okay. Well, the point is that we don't know that for a fact, but um, at least last, as of last week, when the provider list was available briefly, and I was able to access it very late in, at night when traffic seemed to be low, um, Santa Monica Hospital I, I saw in networks. I did not see the Reagan Medical Center in any of the networks that I was looking at. But that's not definitive. That I don't want anybody in this room or anybody listening to the <laughs> webinar. <laughs> <laughs> the caveat is that was oh that was information as of a week ago and it may not be relevant today. Yes, Peggy. Yeah, go ahead. So like maybe um, you know you're carrying your spouse. Can your spouse um, get their own insurance? How does that work? No, no. So if you're buying for now, uh, you, everybody in the family does not have to be insured. So it is possible to uh, qualify for a subsidy and not cover everybody in the family. And so your FPL is a function of your family. So you've got to report everybody in the family to determine what your FPL is because it's a combination of your income and the number of people. But you may not want to insure everybody in the household in the exchange policy but you don't have a choice of splitting coverage. So if there are five people in your family, let's say your spouse is, is covered at their place of employment, but, no, but they don't offer the opportunity to cover you. So you're gonna go into the exchange, you report your spouse as part of your family, but you're not covering him or her. And so you're asking for coverage for one adult, maybe and two children, let's say. They all have that. Okay. So whatever it is. Yeah, whatever plan you're shopping for is the plan that everybody. Now, I will say that, um, you know, if you have children and uh, your income is below 250, uh, it's possible that your children would qualify for Medi Cal and you would be uh, qualified for, uh, you don't qualify for Medi Cal, you qualify for one of the plans. And it's my understanding that. In that circumstance, you can opt out and put your children into the non medical plan. But it, um, but that is currently, I, I don't know how easy that is to do online right now because I haven't gone through the, the, the uh, enrollment process. I, I mean, I can't go through the enrollment process as a hypothetical. So I want to thank everybody. Uh, for uh, attending today. As you can see, there obviously are ongoing challenges with the Affordable Care Act. Um, and um, I wanted to let everyone know, thanks for attending both in person and online. Uh, our next speaker will be Dylan Robin, who is uh, uh, also working on these issues. He'll be talking on November 13th. And do we have Dylan's topic? To be determined. To be determined. <laughs> Likely to have an ACA, but it could be could be something else. Thank you very much for attending.